uh, any of the local organizers here. So we're going to start the session now. It's already 10 minutes past. Um, so um, this is the session on coastal risk. Thank you all for being here. And uh, the first talk is from uh, Amy Slangen, uh, who's joining us online from uh, the Netherlands. So uh, welcome, Amy. And uh, we can take it from here. Thanks. Yes, let me unmute. So do you hear and see everything OK? Yes, we can hear you, Amy. Yes. OK, yes. great. And you see the right presentation? Yeah, I think yes. so, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. OK. Um, yeah, so um, thank you for uh, having me uh, speak at this uh, at this workshop today, um, and I will be uh, the first of this block on uh, on sea level related uh, risks and impacts, um, and I will be introducing uh, how we model the sea level uh, change projections in AI6. Um, so I was part of the working group one chapter nine report uh, where we um, focus on the observed and modeled changes in uh, in sea level change. Uh, yeah, let me see. Okay, so uh, you probably all have an idea of sea level change. So there's a lot of processes that come together in something as simple as the level of um, of the ocean, basically. Um, so you can see in this figure, um, there is uh, the, the ice sheets. Uh, when they melt, they contribute to sea level rise. But also if the <clears throat> heat, of course, is a very important um, contributor because warming water expands, so therefore the sea level rises. Um, but there's also groundwater extraction, uh, meltwater runoff, mountain glaciers. And of course, all of that um, leads to changes in how the sea level extremes uh, behave. So the this these processes, so melting, melting, melting ice, warming ocean, they influence how the mean sea level changes. But that, in turn, affects how the extremes on a beach or on a coast will be felt um, when you get a surge or a high tide or such. So you can imagine if you want to model this, there's a lot of processes that you need to in uh, take into account. And unfortunately, we don't have one model that we can use to do this. Um, it would be great if we did, but instead we have this spaghetti of different contributions, different models that we need to piece together in order to get to sea level projections. So um, I'm not going to go through all the details of this plot, um, but basically in the um, in the yellow blocks, you can see all the different contributors. So this is vertical land movement from the top to the bottom, vertical land movement, terrestrial water storage, ice sheet contribution, glacier contribution, thermal expansion and dynamic sea level. And you need to individually model each of these processes in order to get to the global mean sea level uh, change projected into the future um, and to the relative sea level change. And the relative sea level change is then how sea level changes spatially, because sea level doesn't ch change at the same rate everywhere. There's large regional variation. So you really need to take into account how it varies from place to place. Um, so we used in the, uh, in the IPCC report, uh, for the first time now we used emulators, uh, for, for instance, the ice sheet contribution and the glacier contributions, um, and emulators are basically simple climate models. So we have these huge climate, we have these climate models, but they take a very long time to run. So you can't run them for every possible scenario, every possible um, thing you can think of because it just takes months to run a climate model. So what we do with these emulators is you have a set of climate model runs and you sort of compare or you use um, methods, linear statistical methods to link these complicated methods to a, a more simpler approach. Um, and then to, to get a PDF, to get a normal distribution of, of how this, for instance, in this case, the ice sheets would contribute to sea level rise. Now, all of these different components um, to, to, to bring those together, so to bring those yellow blocks together into the red block, basically, um, 
uh, we developed a framework called FACTS, a framework for analyzing changes to sea level. Um, and this is a, a framework where you have a module. Uh, it's a modularized framework. So for every contribution, for instance, for the ice sheet, for Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland ice sheet, thermal expansion, you have a module. Um, and, and you can also change those modules. So if you have a new ice sheet model, you can use that. You can replace the current module and, and build a new module for it. Um, and this was set up uh, mainly by Greg Garner uh, and Bob Kopp in the US. Um, and, and it's also published, uh, it's, it's freely available on GitHub. Everyone can download it. Um, it's still, uh, we're still working on making it more user-friendly. Um, and, and we also welcome um, users' feedback from that as well. Um, and there's a paper currently in review for um, geoscientific model development presenting this facts framework as well. Um, but this is facts framework where we, so we combine these modules um, and then to make the, the sea level projections. Um, <clears throat> another thing that we did in this AS6 report is that we made the sea level projections uh, consistent with the assessed equilibrium climate sensitivity and surface temperature. Now, what is equilibrium climate sensitivity? That is when you uh, double in a model, you double the CO2 amount and you uh, see how long it takes uh, or when when the surface temperature um, uh, stabilizes again. Um, and, and this is a measure that we use to, to evaluate climate models as well. Um, and, and what we saw was that in the newer set of climate models, the most recent set of climate models, so um, the CMIP-6 climate models, um, this equilibrium climate sensitivity range was larger than it was before in the CMIP-5 climate models. And also in what we knew to be the best, well, what was what was thought to be the best range, the best estimate of this equilibrium climate sensitivity. Um, so the uh, AS6, the IPC report, um, assessed the equilibrium climate sensitivity, came up with a range. And what we did is we used these emulators to um, sort of trim the, 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 the distribution so that this equilibrium climate se sensitivity is um, the most correct or closest to the assessed equilibrium climate sensitivity. Um, yeah, so this was used for the projections to the year 2100. And then for the projections to 2300, we used a literature assessment. So that was really looking into the literature and, and seeing uh, what are the different values that are around the different model estimates um, and how do these compare to each other. Um, well, for 2100, we, we ran this fact framework um, to make new uh, projections, basically. So what do you need to make projections? Uh, well, you need uh, scenarios of um, how uh, the climate might develop and how do we do that in um, in the physical climate world we use uh, scenarios of carbon dioxide um, so in this graph on the left you can see in the for instance in the bottom line which is uh, the light blue line uh, there's a scenario called SSP 119 um, which um, has goes back really quickly to uh, about zero uh, CO2 emissions by the year 2050 Whereas on the other end, we have a dark red line, which doubles the current CO2 emissions by the year 2050. So by, by making these scenarios, you can make an envelope of, of the different types of um, um, how, how the climate might develop. So we can ask the question, if everyone, if, if this CO2 emissions would, would go down really quickly, what would happen to the climate and what would happen to the sea level? So on the right, you can see what this what the output then is from the climate models. If you use this um, this light blue, you get to about one and a half degrees by the year twenty one hundred. If you use the dark red, you would get closer towards the four and a half five degrees of warming by the year twenty one hundred. Now we've uh, the Paris Agreement. That's the closest to this lower light blue scenario. So that's the one um, that we're aiming for as a world, basically. Um, of course, the question is, what does this mean for um, for sea level? So here um, I show what the sea level, how, how this global mean sea level looks for the different contributions. 
So we have, for instance, uh, in this black line, the thermal expansion, in the light blue, the glacier contribution, the gray is the Greenland ice sheet contribution, uh, brown, uh, the Antarctic, and then dark blue is the land water storage. So you can see that each of these contributions has, um, has its own um, sea level contribution. Yeah, so there's difference. And then, of course, we're going to add them together into global mean sea level projections, total global mean. Um, and those are the colored lines you see in this graph. So you can see for the Paris Agreement scenario, you would end up just uh, around, well, so this is with regards to the year 1900, by the way. So it would be about half a meter compared to the year 1900, um, um, or a, a higher scenario that is closer to a meter uh, of sea level rise. These are the so-called medium confidence scenarios. And these medium confidence scenarios, they, they include the contributions that we're fairly sure of, that we have a relatively good idea of what that they're gonna happen and how they will respond. We can model them. We have faith in, in how we model them. Um, so that's thermal expansion, ocean dynamics, Greenland, Antarctica, um, sort of the, the, the uh, surface mass balance processes on those glaciers, uh, groundwater and dams, and vertical land movement. Of course, there's still significant uncertainties with each of these. So we still have medium confidence and not high confidence. Um, but this is already, so this is sort of the, the average set of sea level projections. And then we have this famous, already famous dashed line up here, um, <clears throat> which is a, a low confidence scenario. And what's what we did in this scenario, there's a couple of, of um, literature, um, some literature available that is pointing to much higher contributions from uh, mainly the Antarctic ice sheet. So um, these projections, they either modeled or they they were um, asking experts about what they think that might happen to Antarctica and how fast it might happen. Um, so there's, but there are like a, a couple of single uh, pro, um, publications about this Antarctic contribution. Um, and then if you would add those contributions, so those Greenland and Antarctic dynamic contributions to the, to the medium confidence projections, you get this really high line. And this is, so this is the 83rd, uh, the 83rd percentile. So it's really the upper range and it's used to inform extremely risk averse policymakers. And it's to say, okay, we we have more confidence in these in these medium confidence projections, but we cannot rule out that a much much higher contribution from the ice sheets might occur, and if it did, it might end up giving values around up to this dashed line. So you you get really an extremely high um, um, sea level uh, scenario, but need to keep in mind we have low confidence in this because there's not that much proof in the scientific literature yet so there's not that much agreement in the scientific literature yet so i basically already said this so so we included the structured expert judgment so that's basically asking experts um and a model that is um modeling mickey marine ice cliff instability um, and if you add those you get to this dashed line um, but yeah, keep in mind, this is deep uncertainty. We really don't know very well what will happen, how fast it will happen, um, and how to model it. Um, what you could do, there's some current situations that we could already look at. Um, and you could, for instance, the Thwaites Glacier in Antarctica is already showing some signs that it might be experiencing this Mickey process, this marine ice cliff instability. And if that happens, you might get a bit of a runaway effect or a very big runaway effect. We're not sure. Um, and that might lead to these accelerated contributions from Greenland. So if, for instance, in the next few decades, we can see this Thwaites Glacier experiencing this these runaway effects, um, that might be an early warning for for in the further future that that this indeed we are moving towards this dashed line rather than to um, the regular um, medium confidence projections. <clears throat> um, yeah, I'm gonna sorry skip this for time. Okay, so 
how do we then get from these global to the regional projections? It's all done in the same in the same go, but um, it is it, it requires an extra step. Um, and that's uh, mainly because of the self-gravitation effect. Um, so if you look at all mass on Earth, it attracts each other. So if we have this giant amount of ice sitting on Antarctica, it's pulling on the ocean. The ocean is also pulling on the ice, but that has a bit less of an effect, obviously. Um, because the ocean can move easier. So normally you would think, okay, I'm going to melt some ice. This will go into the ocean and the ocean will rise at the same rate everywhere. But instead, because you have less ice now sitting on Antarctica, it's pulling less hard on the sea, on the ocean. So because of this loss of gravitational attraction, actually close to the ice sheet, the sea level will fall. Whereas further away, sea level will rise. Um, and of course, it's still this amount of water needs to be distributed around the ocean. So the further away you get, actually, the more sea level rise you get. So for instance, for us in, in, um, in Europe, for me in Europe, um, Antarctica is the one to watch because we are further away from Antarctica than we are from Greenland. But if you're living in uh, in South Africa, actually you're closer to Antarctica. So the one to watch then is Greenland because that's on the other side of the ocean. So instead, um, if Greenland loses mass, you will get an above average sea level rise in Southern Africa. Um, and here you can see the effect uh, this has on, on uh, the spatial uh, distribution. So here again in the top, if you melt a uh, mass in Antarctica, then you can see that towards the northern hemisphere, um, the, the the sea level rises faster, where in the opposite happens for Greenland. So if you melt mass on Greenland, actually towards the southern hemisphere, this uh, amount of sea level rise increases. Now you can do this for all of the different contributions, and here you again see them for the two uh, for two scenarios. So the lower um, SSP one one six one two six scenario and the upper five eight five scenario, I think. Um, and then comparing, you can see very clearly these gravitational patterns in the glaciers, in the ice sheets in Greenland, and in the land water storage. Then for ocean dynamics and thermal expansion, that is mainly derived from climate modeling. Um, and you can see a lot of variability. Um, this is also driven by wind. It's driven by density variation, so temperature, salinity. Um, so changes in the flow of the ocean will come across in this ocean dynamics component. Um, and then we have a vertical land motion component that is um, not uh, scenario dependent. So it's mainly uh, dependent on um, the loss of ice masses after the last glacial maximum, but it can also be tectonics, volcanic eruptions, um, local subsidence due to groundwater extraction or oil extraction. So vertical land motion is really a very complicated uh, factor um, because there's a large human component in it. So if a certain city is really um, extracting more and more groundwater, it might lead to that city actually sinking. Um, and therefore, if your city sinks, it means you will experience more sea level rise. So if you add this all together, um, here uh, I show the uh, on the left the Paris Agreement scenario, on the right is more the scenario that we're currently heading for, if you think about three, three and a half um, degrees of warming. Um, and and from this, uh, so this adds up all the different patterns. So you can see close to the ice sheets that there's a sea level fall, but you can also see the large spatial differences coming from this um, um, uh, ocean dynamics component. So it's important to realize that everywhere around the coast, like at every coastal point, basically, you will um, experience a sea level rise that is not the same as the global mean. But approximately two thirds of the global coastline does have a value that is within about 20% of the global mean. So the global mean is a nice, good first um, aim direction, uh, if you will, but it's important to go and dig into what is causing the sea level rise at every location um, to figure out what might happen to sea level rise at your particular coast. Um, now, if we go towards the longer term, uh, because so far I've mainly talked about until the year 2100, um, we know that sea level rise will continue for some quite some time to come. Um, and that's because um, 
the ice sheets are currently still not in equilibrium with the current climate. So they, they don't even know that the sea that the temperature has risen that much already. Um, the deep ocean doesn't even know. So that's still coming. Um, but there's also something we can do. So by um, reducing the greenhouse gas emissions as fast as we can, we can reduce the speed of this sea level rise um, um, also in the on the longer term. Um, and that's really important. So because the speed of sea level rise will also determine how fast, how much time you have to adapt to a rising sea level. So if you really look into this far right plot, um, we see that under a low emission scenario, the ranges are enormous. The uncertainty is enormous, of course, if you go towards these longer timescales, um, both because of the modeling, but also or mainly because we don't really know what people are going to do. So that makes um, the year 2300 a quite difficult um, projection horizon. Um, but if you look at the lower emission scenario, you could see somewhere between half and three meter of sea level rise. Whereas for a very high emission scenario, it could be two to seven or much more if these accelerations processes on Antarctica really start kicking in. So the question really is not if we will reach say half or one or one and a half or maybe even two meters of sea level rise, but the question is when. Um, and you can uh, look at it therefore from a different sort of, you can flip the framework um, and look at when will we see half a meter of sea level rise? When will we see one meter of sea level rise? And then if you look at this plot on the right, you can see that for a very low emission scenario, the first opportunity to see this half meter is already before the year 2100. Um, and and for the higher scenarios, it's it's moving. There's there's more and more probability that we will see this half meter before the year 2100. Um, and if you go and look at the top, then this two meter might first occur around the year 2100, but it could also be quite a lot later. Um, but in in most of these scenarios, actually before the year 2300, we would have crossed this two meter threshold. Um, so yeah, this is really important if you're looking at, at how to adapt to sea level rise, um, how to protect a coastline. Um, the faster the sea level rises, um, the less time you have to plan, to think ahead, um, to, to, to build something or to come up with plans um, to, to adapt to the sea level rise. Now, what we did in this uh, IPC report is... Um, there's a lot more focus on regional information. Um, so we have these regional fact sheets, we have the interactive atlas, and for sea level specifically, we built this sea level tool together with the NASA, which is showing the IPCC sea level projections. Um, and what you can do is um, you can enter this, uh, this tool, everyone should be able to enter using this address on the top. Um, and then um, you can select which process you want to show. Do you want to see total sea level? What what decade do you want to see it for? And what scenario? And then click on update the map. Um, I don't know if I can. Well, and then you see these blue dots all over. Those are tide gauge measurements. Um, and you can see traditionally there's there's a higher concentration of tide gauge measurements in the in the northern hemisphere, um, and a lower in the southern hemisphere generally. Um, but actually that doesn't matter much for the sea level projections because you can click on any point, oops, um, on any point in this map and get a sea level projection for that point. So you're not dependent on, on, the, on the past observations, basically. Um, you can click on any uh, desired point across your coastline and see, it will then give you line graphs um, for the sea level, the mean sea level projections along your coast. So to wrap up, I think I've almost yeah, talked for about 20 minutes. Um, so we know that sea level is um, going to continue to rise throughout the 21st century and beyond. Um, but, but the rate of this rise is really strongly determined by how much greenhouse gases we emit as a world. So um, we will get sea level rise, but how fast and how long it will continue um, really depends uh, for a lot on... on um, on the policies that are made. Um, but it's good to keep in mind that even under strong emission reductions, the sea level rise will continue and it could still amount to about one to three meters by the year uh, 2300. And uh, with that, I think I'll take any short questions, but I'll leave it up to Rosh to organize uh, further from there. Thank you.
thank you, Amy. Um, do we ask some questions now or go later, Erica? We can do them later. Yeah. Maybe one burning question. Is there anybody who has a burning question to ask?